A man started to feel sick after drinking large volumes of tea. Eventually, he became unresponsive. This video explains what happened after and what might have been the cause. A 21-year-old man, Barry, liked drinking tea. It wasn't your ordinary tea. The recipe was found online and drinking it on a regular basis helped him cope with his chronic pain and depression. As a result, he drank large amounts of tea daily. Nevertheless, one day after drinking, he started to feel weird. He felt hazy and nauseous. He vomited large amounts of liquid and soon his consciousness started to fade. He was later found by his family and to their shock he was unconscious, unresponsive and barely breathing. Immediately the emergency services were called. Emergency reach service. When the paramedics arrived, they found that he had become cyanotic. Cyanotic or cyanosis means that there isn't enough oxygen in the blood or the circulation of blood is poor and this is related to problems regarding the lungs and the heart. While paramedics found his blood pressure to be normal, initial inspection and examination showed a low heart and breathing rate, also known as bradycardia and bradypnea. Assessment of the eyes showed bilateral meiosis. Meiosis meaning the excessive constriction of the pupil and bilateral meaning that it affects both pupils. As the patient was unconscious, the paramedics used a scale which assesses the level of consciousness and of possible brain injury. It's known as the Glasgow Coma Scale and is used by health professionals to assess the patient's ability to use speech, eye and body movements. Depending on how the patient responds, points are given and overall it is scored out of 15. 15 indicates a fully awake, normal individual. After using the assessment, the paramedics had found that the 21-year-old scored 3 out of 15, which meant that he was completely unresponsive. Now, a reduced heart rate, breathing rate and meiosis are typical in people who suffer from opioid overdose. Opioids are typically used to induce sedation. They are used in surgeries for anesthesia and for pain relief. For example, codeine is contained in cocodamol and fentanyl is a commonly used anesthetic drug during surgery. Opioids, not surprisingly, can also be used illegally as heroin and can come with some potentially devastating side effects such as respiratory depression. If not treated on time, opioid overdose can be fatal. The paramedics, knowing this, suspected opioid overdose and administered 400 micrograms of naloxone intravenously. Naloxone is an opioid antagonist, so it reverses the effects of opioids. After the administration of naloxone, the patient's vital signs did improve and he started to gain consciousness, albeit he was too confused to talk about what happened prior. The patient was taken to the emergency department and his arterial blood gases were measured. Arterial blood gases allow us to directly measure oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the arterial blood, making a useful analysis in issues regarding the lungs, kidneys and heart. Levels indicated mixed respiratory and metabolic acidosis. This meant there was an increase in acid in the patient's blood and this was most likely due to the low respiratory rate leading to the patient breathing in less oxygen. Conversely, this would mean that there was a buildup of acidic waste gases such as carbon dioxide. An electrocardiogram or ECG was conducted. ECG helps us to record the electrical activity of the heart and the results here were interesting. The patient's ECG showed signs of Brugada syndrome. Now before I start going into this syndrome, it's probably best for me to talk about the heart or more specifically the heart cells. So normally the heart cells or cardiomyocytes have voltage gated channels such as sodium channels which help pass electrical impulses. These impulses in turn help the heart perform its pumping action which causes the delivery of blood throughout the body. 
Now, in Brugada syndrome, these sodium channels become abnormal, which cause problems in the electrical activity and the conduction of the heart. So disturbances here will lead to various pathological changes. The typical signs of Brugada syndrome is dizziness, fainting, irregular heartbeats, palpitations, and the patient gasping for air. The thing is, Brugada syndrome is a genetic disorder and whether this happened to our patient due to him having the syndrome or it being a cause of drug overdose was hard to distinguish. At this point, the patient's blood pressure also started to deteriorate. In response, intravenous fluids were given to help with this but the blood pressure continued to stay low. The patient at this point also disclosed that he had drunk large amounts of poppy seed tea to help with his chronic pain and his medical history had shown he had been prescribed cetraline and mirazapine for his depression. Further blood tests revealed that his troponin and creatinine levels were high. Both indicate various things. Troponin itself is a protein that is found in heart muscles and isn't typically found in the blood. It is released during heart trauma and this could happen for example in heart attacks. Creatinine is a waste product made by the muscles. The kidneys act as a filter and normally remove it from the blood and into the urine. Increased levels of creatinine in the blood means that there is a problem with the kidneys as they aren't normally carrying out their functions as a filtering system. It could indicate kidney damage which is common in drug overdose or toxicity. This would also explain the metabolic acidosis as mentioned previously as the kidneys play a role in removing excess acid. To understand if there was any changes to his organs, imaging studies such as abdominal ultrasound and transthoracic echocardiography were conducted. Both imaging techniques use similar technologies but echocardiography focuses primarily on the heart. The results showed that the abdominal ultrasound was unremarkable but the echocardiogram showed severe global biventricular systolic dysfunction. What this meant was that the lower two chambers of the heart, known as the ventricles, were impaired, compromising blood flow throughout the body. Further treatment of naloxone and magnesium were given to help with the ongoing issue with his heart and possible opioid overdose. However, the patient had shown no positive response. Seeing the situation isn't getting any better, the UK and PIS or United Kingdom National Poisons Information Services were consulted. They advised a much higher dose of naloxone given intravenously, a bolus of 2 mg naloxone followed by 2 mg of the drug per hour. Once administered, this seemed to do the trick as the patient's blood pressure started to improve. He was then transferred to the cardiac thoracic critical care unit for observation and remained there for a few more days as his vitals started to improve. A repeat echocardiogram was done and this time there was no residual structural or functional abnormalities which meant there was no long-term damage to his heart. Other tests such as ECG came back normal and not long after he was discharged once his cognition and vital signs were back to normal. The patient later remarked, After initial treatment, I regained most of my consciousness and was moved to the cardiothoracic unit. I received the best of care and could not fault the staff. However, I could not seem to relax, likely due to the rapid precipitated withdrawal. Combined with shock and the shame of being found in this predicament by my family, including my younger brother. Despite being highly traumatic, somewhat embarrassing and extremely burdensome to both the lives of my family and me, the experience had ironically been a character building and a valuable one. I believe this because this was the incident that inspired me to receive help from Narcotics Anonymous and other support groups. So what happened? The main problem here was an opioid overdose from the poppy seed tea. Opioids such as morphine is extracted from the poppy flower. Now these plants grow from poppy seeds but these seeds do not normally contain any opium. So how did the opium get into his tea? To understand this better, we need to delve in deeper into the poppy plant. So poppy seed is an oil seed acquired from the plant Papivarum soniferum L and is generally used in food and made into edible oil. The plant itself has a growth cycle of about 120 days, it flowers after 90 days and continues this process for about 2-3 to three weeks until its petals fall off revealing green pods or capsules. The pod contains opium alkaloids or the chemicals which cause various pharmacological effects and this is stored in the latex. 
The latex, also known as the milky sap, is within the wall of the pod. Because opium is within the wall itself, cultivators need to spore the pod to make it bleed. The seeds themselves are stored within the hollow part of the pod and as a result are generally not in contact with the milky sap. Once the milk has been harvested, then the pod is opened for the seeds to be taken. Home. I mean, towards the end of the season, the petals wilt and what's left behind is a seed pod. You take a mature seed pod and uh, inside, the poppy seed. But opium's in a different matter. They use a tool like this with half a dozen little needle points on the end. And in the evening, put a scratch in the pod. It bleeds that milk immediately and then they leave it overnight to congeal and come back in the morning with this tool and scrape it off. It These seeds are then dried in the sun and go through a process to remove any opium contamination. Because of this, poppy seeds normally do not contain any opium alkaloids. However, there are exceptions. Issues during harvesting or processing of the seeds can lead to cross-contamination. In addition to this, insect damage via chewing of the unripe capsule walls can lead to droplets of opium milk falling on the surface of the seeds. As said previously, opioids have various uses and is known as a depressant drug. So its main effects are to suppress pain, induce sedation and help with anxiety. It could also induce euphoria or the state of feeling intense joy and this is something heroin addicts look for. Now, normally, while poppy seeds don't have any alkaloids, if contaminated, they can contain over 40 different alkaloids, of which 5 of them make up the majority of the alkaloid content. These are morphine, codeine, thebane, papaverine, and noscapine. This patient most likely had contaminated poppy seeds. He did admit he bought these seeds from the internet from a supermarket chain that was otherwise different from where he normally bought from. Since the opium is on the shell of the seeds, brewing these in hot water will release opium into the tea and considering the large amounts drunk by the patient, it's safe to say that the opioid overdose occurred due to this. And while this does explain the initial symptoms of low respiratory rate, unconsciousness and unresponsiveness, it doesn't exactly explain the Brugada syndrome. Increase in troponin suggested there was damage to the heart and this was backed up by the echocardiography which suggested impaired ventricles. As a result, the heart couldn't function fully and led to the patient going into shock which explains the declining blood pressure and cyanosis. Shock is the condition in which the blood flow throughout the body is compromised leading to the organs becoming deprived of oxygen. If not corrected on time, it can lead to death. This specific heart rate shock is known as a cardiogenic shock and as it did happen rapidly due to opioid overdose, it was thus labelled as acute cardiotoxicity. While why it happened isn't fully understood, a few theories can be looked at. As I said before, Brugada syndrome's main etiology is genetic and drug causes are rare. One theory is related to the other medications the patient had taken. The patient did suffer from depression and was taken cetraline and mirtazapine. Zetraline is known to have side effects concerning the heart and this includes conduction abnormalities. Mirtazapine, which is used to treat depression, is associated with conduction abnormalities if overdosed and has been associated with Brugada syndrome. From what was said by the patient, these drugs were taken in the doses prescribed. So Brugada syndrome may be the result of the combined effect of the prescribed drugs and the opioids. However, Opioid overdose probably is the main reason as the patient did get better after high doses of naloxone were administered and naloxone itself is the main treatment to opioid overdose. Further discussions with the UK NPIS revealed that this syndrome could be due to some opioid alkaloids causing abnormalities in the sodium channels in cardiomyocytes. These abnormalities led to an impaired inflow of sodium ions leading to a longer refractory period and this led to the biventricular failure. In short, the opium alkaloids could have caused irregular heartbeats and slow down the heart rate, while morphine and codeine haven't historically shown to cause problems in sodium channels, other alkaloids such as papaverine have been associated with this. The interesting thing here is that there was no long-term significant cardiac damage and this was shown by the echocardiography. 
This may be because of the cardioprotective effects of certain alkaloids found in opium. Opioids work by attaching to specific receptors throughout the body. These receptors are known as delta, mu and kappa. Once attached, the various pharmacological effects are carried out. Delta and kappa receptors are in the myocardium or in the muscle layer of the heart. Activating these receptors actually help reduce cardiac damage during ischemic events or heart attacks. It was suggested that the morphine may have been the alkaloid responsible for negating long-term heart damage. While it is hard to determine specifics, what can be said is that some alkaloids did cause disturbances in the heart while others prevented long-lasting damage. This is what most likely happened as the patient was discharged without further problems once the overdose was treated. It really is an odd case as the chemicals which caused the problem also stopped further issues from happening. As I was researching this, I came across many pages and videos on the potential benefits of poppy seed tea. And this includes with sleep, digestion, anxiety and depression, the latter of which was in the medical history of the 21 year old patient. Other uses are also to help with withdrawal symptoms. Herbal products have become popular recently due to social media marketing and influencers. But potential dangers are often in the small print or minimally mentioned and so risks are not always noticed by consumers. It's safe to say that while such cases are in the minority, measures need to be taken to reduce contaminated seeds in circulation. Giving warning labels and instructions on how to prepare such seeds would be beneficial, but laws need to be put forward to ensure higher quality assurance when processing and importing poppy seeds. I hope you liked this case video and let me know what you thought of it in the comments below. The main case report I used for this video is in the description box below. It's pretty interesting and I would recommend you give it a look. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.